throughout all of human history, it took more, more and more energy to create any level of economic growth and jobs. And it's important to note that over the past few years, that has changed. And we live in a new era and a new time where each year here in the United States, we are using less and less energy, as I mentioned before. And that energy is with a cleaner and cleaner profile. Uh, and it is my firm expectation uh, that we can see more of that economic growth and that clean energy growth here in Maryland. And today I have a, a distinguished group of panelists here to help get into the details and specifically focus on the policy uh, and the type of actions that we need to take to accelerate uh, investment. And since none of us have tested our microphones so far, we'll see how it goes. Um, but uh, well, first, we'll, I'll, I'll do brief introductions and, and read bios, and then we'll hear from, from each of our experts uh, individually. Uh, but John, if you don't uh, mind raising your hand to, to show folks who you are here. Uh, John Fiastro is the Director of Government Affairs and Policy with the Maryland Energy Administration. John has been with MEA since 2015, where he has worked in concert with the governor's office and state legislature to create state energy policies that ensure a resilient energy future for Maryland while protecting the financial interests of the state and ratepayers. From 2011 to 2015, Fiastro served as chief of staff for two Eastern Shore senators. John also has in his bio that cheese is a frequent subject of conversation between he and his wife. That's right. <laughs> talk about it. We do, my, I talk about it a lot with my wife, too. Um, but uh, I, I thought that was great that you included that. More than that. 12. <laughs> <laughs> Heated debate. Um, Kelly Speaks Beckman is, is right here uh, next to me, CEO of the Energy Storage Association. Kelly is the first chief executive officer for the National Trade Organization for Energy Storage as an industry. As CEO, she leads the association's efforts to represent the interests of energy storage in the United States, including policy, external relations, and industry leadership. Prior to joining ESA, Kelly was part of the executive team of the Alliance to Save Energy, a premier trade association representing the energy efficiency sector. Uh, Jeff Eckel, Jeff, if you don't mind uh, raising your hand there, is president and CEO of Hannon Armstrong. Hannon Armstrong is a New York Stock Exchange listed capital and services provider focused on the sustainable infrastructure markets that reduce climate changing greenhouse gas emissions as well as mitigating the impacts of or increasing resiliency to climate change. Mr. Eccles' experience spans more than 30 years and includes the creation of management of energy service companies as well as projects and corporate finance functions. He has held senior executive positions as CEO of Energy Works, CEO of Wartzilla Power Development. Did I say that right? Yes. Holy cow. And with Booz Allen but in its energy not. practice. David Fine is Vice President of State Government Affairs at Exelon. David is responsible for directing and overseeing a team that implements Exelon's state-level policy, regulatory, and legislative advocacy efforts in support of its retail, wholesale, and power generation and development businesses in the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, New England, and New York regions of the country. David has testified before several commerce and public utility commissions nationwide, including in Maryland, on a wide range of energy issues. Prior to assuming his current role, Mr. Fine was VP of Energy Policy and Director of Retail Energy Policy at Constellation. So those are the, the basic backgrounds for, for each of our panelists. Um, but Kelly, I'll, I'll start with you, and if you don't mind, just providing a brief introduction on, on the Energy Storage Association and how you all fit into the clean energy conversation from a policy standpoint. Sure, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, bearing with the weather to get in here this morning. I know um, it's not so easy getting around in sort of sleety weather, especially in Maryland. We're, um, a little bit shy of uh, the, uh, the off weather here. <laughs> but um, so Energy Storage Association, we are, as, as mentioned earlier, the uh, National Trade Association for Storage. And that means all technologies of storage. Most of what you hear about today in the news is uh, about batteries, lithium ion batteries to be specific. But energy storage is much more than that. It's thermal storage, it's ice storage, it's mechanical storage, it's um, flywheels, it's, it's all of the types of storage that, bas the basic tenet of it is it decouples the element of time 
from the supply and demand of energy, which has never been done before in the electricity markets. And so we are here to help to make sure that markets are open for competition, for storage providers, as well as utilities to be able to provide storage to the market for a more efficient, a more sustainable, resilient, and effective grid. We are about 150 members of, as I mentioned, all types of energy storage. I see a few members here in the audience and on stage as well. Um, we uh, span the, the, the gamut of startups to uh, Fortune 50 companies. Uh, we have uh, component suppliers, we have manufacturers, we have developers, we have utilities in our, in our storage business. And we basically work to open markets in terms of both the regulatory and the legislative uh, opportunities uh, for storage at the state level, at the RTO, ISO level, and at the federal level. So that's a little bit about who we are. Here in Maryland, um, I'm, I'm happy to say in my own home state, we are the very first state to have passed a, um, uh, a legislation for tax incentive for energy storage. There are others that are coming, believe me, um, and uh, so I'm really proud to have been here in this first state. So thank you for having me, and I look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank, thank you, Kelly, for uh, introducing ESA. John, if you don't mind introducing, what's uh, MEA's role in, in the clean energy space? The governor uh, talked about a, a couple of recent activities, but understanding MEA's mandate, I think, would be helpful for folks. Sure. Uh, MEA is a state agency, the Maryland Energy Administration, <coughs> and I always loved MEA because, and, and Kelly probably can attest to this as well, MEA has a license, despite the fact that it only has about 30 state employees compared to tens of thousands across the the, the rest of the uh, uh, state employee populace. Uh, we ha have a, a license basically to stick our nose into just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and for those who, who know me, I like that. And, uh, and, and so, <laughs> I see some friends nodding in the green. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so we actually are in a position to uh, advise the governor and advise the General Assembly. We're right in the middle of the 90-day session, for those of you who are, are not aware. Uh, yesterday was crossover, and so there are still bills that are alive, and so we work on those bills to make sure that they're in a fashion that we, have, we, we think are in the best interest of both uh, the industry, but also of the ratepayer as well. MEA, uh, like I said, is statutorily mandated, and one of our mandates is actually to participate and represent the state in front of proceedings in, the, uh, in front of the state's Public Service Commission as well. Uh, so no matter what the proceeding is, uh, if it deals with energy, uh, we have a role there, and, uh, and, and we take that role seriously, and, and uh, it seems like my guys at this point, our, our, our policy team spends more time in front of the Public Service Commission in those proceedings than actually in the General Assembly some days. So we're extraordinarily busy, and, and, <coughs> Good. and that's what we're up to. All right, well, well thank you, John. Uh, Jeff, what's Hannon Armstrong? I know it has to deal with money, that's good. But uh, beyond that, what, uh, what's Hannon Armstrong's role in this well, clean energy space? We problem, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hannon Armstrong has been doing clean energy investment since the 80s. Um, we may be Annapolis's uh, best kept secret, uh, we're 50 people strong over Gordon Beers in Indianapolis Town Center and uh, went public approximately five years ago uh, after 32 years of being private for two very simple reasons. Uh, we look at climate change as the defining issue of our generation and since we've been doing it longer, we think we have a lot to offer. And second, the uh, entire energy industry is being disrupted by the trends of uh, decentralization digitalization and decarbonization, uh, whether it's through energy storage, whether it's through PV, or whether it's through uh, the great energy efficiency solutions that somebody like Johnson Controls or Honeywell is providing, uh, all customers of ours. Uh, we invest about a billion dollars a year annually, so that would be about five billion dollars since going public. In Maryland, uh, we've invested uh, close to 500 million uh, since going public. It's much more than that uh, over the history of the firm, and it uh, covers the range of efficiency investments um, in federal buildings in Baltimore County schools and a number of other um, uh, installations. Uh, we've done a number of solar farms around the, uh, around the state and uh, are seeing actually a, a rather nice uptick in sustainable infrastructure uh, beyond efficiency and renewables. 
we've uh, invested about $150 million in Aberdeen Proving Ground for transmission distribution upgrades, which really are for resiliency uh, at that very important um, uh, Army uh, uh, base. Uh, we also are seeing stormwater remediation projects starting to get to scale, starting to happen using private sector financing. And, and I just need to emphasize uh, this is a government-oriented group, but uh, we absolutely believe that the private sector is, and financing is the key to uh, the rapid adoption of clean energy uh, technology. It's helpful when there's a supportive public policy uh, uh, backdrop, whether it's state or, uh, or national policy. Uh, but really, we don't have um, that much time to fix um, uh, a growing CO2 uh, uh, mm -hmm. problem that we can wait for policy to be supportive. So companies like us need to find the private sector solutions to get to scale quickly. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, several excellent subsidiaries as, as clients of ours, uh, whether it's bg and &E, Constellation, Pepco. Uh, who did who'd you buy in Philadelphia? Pico. Pico, yes. Uh, uh, and comment. So with that, I'll turn it to my colleague. Sound, sounds good. Thank you, Jeff, for, for that. And, and yeah, David, I think that's a great uh, queue up for Exelon. I know you all are an energy company, but I don't pay my bill to you directly, or, or do I? Uh, if you could uh, provide a little context on what Exelon is and, and how big you all are. Sure. Um, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Exelon is, uh, is a Fortune 100 company. Uh, we have over 34,000 employees. We own six utilities. Uh, across the country. Uh, John mentioned our, our local presence here and on the eastern seaboard, uh, but also uh, in Chicago, Illinois, which is where I uh, hail from. Um, we, are, uh, we are one of the last left standing what they call integrated energy companies who has a regulated utility and a merchant, a large merchant generation fleet. Uh, we have over uh, 32,000 megawatts of power uh, largest clean, mission-free generator in the country uh, with generation of all sorts, uh, uh, nuclear, wind, solar, um, biomass, and some natural gas. We own no coal, uh, company used to, and divested all of that. Uh, we have 10 million electric and gas utility customers around the country. Uh, our constellation business serves over 2.2 million uh, residential, uh, public sector, commercial, industrial customers of, of all sizes. Um, that's who we are. Uh, we're uh, committed and always have been to sustainability and to addressing climate change. The company has long been a advocate when a lot of our peers were not, that was not a place they wanted to be, but we've always been uh, a, a, a steward of the environment and advocating for policies to address climate change both at the federal level uh, and in the various states in which uh, we operate. Great, thank you, David, for that overview, and, and thank you all for, for your leadership and engagement in this space. John, my first question is for you. When, when the governor was making his remarks, he mentioned that uh, photovoltaic installations have, have doubled in, in Maryland over the last three years. Uh, what is MEA, you know, how, how is MEA's approach to engaging the private sector to further stimulate uh, some of that investment uh, within the boundaries of the state. Sure. You know, one of the keystones, and the governor mentioned it, one of the keystones of the governor's agenda has been raising the uh, goal uh, by which Maryland will reduce its greenhouse gas emissions uh, by, to 40% by 2030. And uh, inclusive of that is a mandate that was agreed upon by the General Assembly and the governor as well, that that, that, that mandate, in meeting it, the state actually have a net economic benefit. And so right now, the state is actually crafting its plan. And jobs and job creation are a central tenet of that plan creation. The idea is, is that we can have our cake and eat it too, right? We can increase uh, our energy efficiency, we can decrease our emissions, and all the while still maintain a healthy and robust in-state economy. And so that's our, that's our mandate in that legislation, and that's what the governor has tasked has to state agencies to do, but not just state agencies. In the construction of the commission uh, that is set forth to craft this plan, we have stakeholders from labor, we have private industry, we have nonprofits, we have academics, uh, we have finance, and so uh, just to name a few. And uh, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating collection of 
uh, of professionals that are committed to both economic growth and environmental stewardship. And so I think it's a fantastic achievement uh, under, under Governor, Governor Hogan's leadership. The governor also mentioned that uh, the uh, MEA is currently uh, in the process of divesting itself of millions of dollars of making investments into uh, solar, but not just solar, but in, uh, renewables across the spectrum, and specifically uh, technologies that may actually end up benefiting Maryland's economies particularly, and one of those is animal waste to energy. Hmm. Um, Maryland has a, uh, has a phosphorus issue, has a nitrogen issue, and a lot of folks uh, uh, that oversee uh, Chesapeake Bay Health point to our agricultural inputs into the bay as one of the main determining factors of, of, uh, of bay health. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, well, what does that have to do with animal waste to energy? Well, animals, uh, an, uh, animal waste, uh, as it relates to some of Maryland's industries, can actually uh, be used to fire tier one generation. We've recognized animal waste to energy as a tier one resource within the state's RPS. And so uh, we have made investments into that as well. The governor last year, uh, an administration bill uh, two, in fact, was the electric vehicle infrastructure bill and tax rebate bill. Uh, that actually benefits uh, supply equipment touching EVs, mm -hmm. also uh, providing tax credits for purchasers of EVs. And then lastly, uh, lastly, we also have the MEII, uh, which uh, the Maryland Energy Innovation Institute, and uh, a commitment that the governor made to MEII along with Maryland Clean Energy Center, which is a uh, which is a, uh, I think Kathy's here, uh, Kathy Magruder is the executive director of Maryland Clean Energy Center, uh, works to benefit uh, large institutional, uh, 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 in, this, in this last year, University of Maryland has been a beneficiary of, of uh, several issuances, uh, lending to support clean energy financing uh, for, for some of our larger nonprofits in the state. So, uh, the governor has been uh, committed to uh, clean energy, clean energy, and job creation at the same time. So. Great, John. Thanks for th for that overview, and I think it's important for us all to hear that that connection between energy generation uh, and actually being able to clean up the water uh, in in terms of removing some of that uh, that animal waste and and farm waste that it, so it can be used more productively uh, and g get a two for one, generate some energy and and clean up the water. That's great. Uh, Kelly, I like talking about Maryland leadership, and, and uh, the governor mentioned, and, and you mentioned in your introductory remarks, uh, the energy storage tax credit. So for those of us who are not tax experts, um, what does that mean, and what is the benefit for, for businesses here in Maryland? Uh, it means a 30% uh, cut on your, on your cost. It, it's a 30% incentive for both um, uh, on both sides of the of the meter, if you will. So for the uh, distribution level or behind the meter, there's a carve out specifically for residential and commercial uh, folks to be able to have a tax incentive break of 30% uh, for your investment in energy storage, which um, really will help if you're, if you're a homeowner and you're going to be investing in energy storage to help that solar run when the sun's not shining, that's going to give you resilience, which is also going to be helping you your pocketbook in terms of what you're not going to lose from your freezer, what you're not going to lose in your medications, um, being able to keep your air conditioning running if it's a derecho, or uh, being able to keep your heat going if, you've got a, if you're in the midst of a snowmageddon or a polar vortex or any one of these number of storms we've had. So it's a really big deal, this uh, investment tax credit. And um, we're working with other states to be able to adopt similar, uh, similar structures. Great, thanks Kelly. I think that uh, your mentioning of resiliency is an important one as we deal with more and more uh, coastal storms. Uh, you know, fortunately we're not in the situation that the folks in Puerto Rico are in in terms of losing power for extended periods of time, but even those short power interruptions uh, can be devastating for local businesses where every dollar counts, uh, every hour that your doors are open really do matter. So, uh, so thanks for, for talking about that. Jeff, uh, from a finance standpoint, how has the demand for clean energy over the last five years changed, and, and what are the bright spots here in Maryland? I think it's uh, uh, changed quite a bit in the last five years. Um, 
five years ago, nobody was uh, investing in residential solar or, or CNI solar. Uh, now that's almost become a commodity product. We've we've been a fairly active uh, investor in it. Uh, wind has always been the uh, the largest investment. But what has continued to chug along and I think is starting to tick up um, nationally is efficiency. Um, part of it is technology driven. Again, companies like Honeywell and Johnson Controls have such great digital solutions now that are much more than light bulbs and HVAC systems. Uh, this is the technology's gotten better. Um, but also, customers want green buildings. I mean, this, this, this building uh, right here, this room is just, um, uh, looks terrible. I'm sure the, the light, uh, uh, somebody can do a great job in, in this, uh, this hotel. Historic. Uh, Opportunity uh, is all around us. Uh, uh, there, there's work to be done. Um, but these are things that are extremely impactful on uh, creating jobs, saving people money, and of course, uh, reducing carbon. Um, what we're seeing, we're very active in the property assessed clean energy business, uh, growing that, that national business, and, and just seeing building owners be driven by their clients. And Clay, I won't steal your thunder because I think you'll probably mention your survey. Um, uh, their clients, their renters want cleaner, greener buildings. Yeah. Um, maybe they care about efficiency, maybe they care about climate change. Doesn't matter as long as they're adopting this technology at scale. So that's been, uh, it, it's almost been a corporate commitment to sustainability despite uh, the withdrawal from Paris or, or perhaps because of uh, uh, withdrawal from Paris that has heightened uh, sensitivity in the boardroom to, to getting ahead of the climate change issue. That all makes for better opportunities for companies like Hannah Armstrong. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff, for, for highlighting some of those uh, those points. And I think illustrating where, where demand is in terms of being very specific about what customers want. This morning I saw in the news that, that McDonald's is announcing you know, climate change objectives for investment in clean energy and, and greenhouse re gas reduction. So, uh, we can see what, what people want, and if they want it in their burger too, that uh, it's going to drive the direction of things. David, what does it mean for clean energy policy for Maryland to have a, a competitive or deregulated uh, energy market? Not every state has that. I spent some time living in Virginia, and there you, you either get dominion power or you get no power. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so what's Exelon's view of, of you know, how to... How are you approaching business here in Maryland, and, and how does the competitive energy market uh, factor into that? Sure. Uh, so uh, for us at Exelon, obviously, um, when you think about clean energy, uh, our clean generation fleet, which is predominantly nuclear, but three of the four wind farms in, in the state are the product of uh, Exelon projects that have been built uh, and when um, you look at uh, the amount of clean energy we have, emission-free, uh, you know, obviously we play a big role in that. And being an integrated company, um, you know, different types of regulatory solutions, different types of legislative solutions, uh, you know, in some respects have one side of our company involved in it and other times have another. Um, our utilities have uh, you know, some uh, proposals out there for electric vehicles. Uh, they're interested in energy storage. Um, that's largely uh, we're seeing on the regulated side of the business. And so the fact that we have a competitive marketplace in Illinois uh, does introduce, er, in Illinois, in Maryland, um, you know, brings in some different issues that policymakers have to grapple with. Uh, I think. Uh, and all of the above and not crowding out anyone and giving everyone an opportunity to something I think Kelly said at the beginning uh, about what her uh, association is about that, you know, uh, we all, I think, want these things. But these things take time to invest in, yeah. uh, take time to develop, uh, and the policy discussions, you know, can be contentious and time consuming whether it's a, a competitive market or not. And this sort of, some of these infrastructure investments, and that's what they are. They're infrastructure investments, they're about resiliency, mm -hmm. they are about clean, and they are very complicated. And um, it's great that Maryland has this tax credit for storage. Uh, it would be great to see some more progress uh, on EVs. Um, other states are moving more aggressively in that regard. Uh, 
Um, you know, our constellation business um, touches customers of all sizes. Uh, and this notion about in the boardroom, the interest on these things is real and alive. Uh, we have a number of national customers who are interested in um, buying cleaner power all the time this comes up. Uh, we have discussions with some who are uh, willing to enter into power purchase agreements that will help get a project <coughs> built. Uh, if they agree to take the offtake, those things are done up front to help uh, get projects across the finish line. That is all done in the competitive environment. That's sure. not done with the backing of ratepayer dollars. So there's a lot of different combinations that we're seeing. Uh, it's an exciting time, uh, challenging on some issues, but um, the interest level, I think, as all the panelists have said, is is obviously at an all-time high. Uh, sure. So, um, you know, it's a it's a different navigation in a in a market like we have here in Maryland that has a competitive industry, but there is a balance that you can find to achieve all these objectives. Sure. Um, it, thank you, David, for for that overview. And it, that I don't know bring, brings up my my first overarching. Uh, question, and I'll, I'll encourage any of you to, to jump into it. Um, you know, here, here in Maryland, I wake up in the morning and I turn on the lights and the power is on. The coffee maker turns on and that's how the day gets started. Um, I used to do a lot of work in, in Africa and Latin America where, where folks are, you know, when, when you're getting that first kilowatt hour, you have a lot of flexibility on how it's going to work. Uh, but they don't have power in every case and, and point. And here we do have power, but it's because of 100 years of built infrastructure that we have all around us. Uh, and so, so how can we invest in clean energy, drive up clean energy generation, uh, and move away from some of those aging assets without increasing rates uh, to customers? What are the, the kind of policy changes that we need to see or uh, investments that we need to see to help, help achieve that goal and make sure that uh, rates don't go up because here in Maryland in particular, industrial customers pay 20% above the national average already, uh, and that really affects business. So um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I'll Actually, I'll question your supposition in that um, I, making sure that rates don't go up. I'm not sure that you can do that and put, make the investments that are required for improved reliability and resilience in the grid. But what you can do is have bills go down, right? So it's a difference between what you see that you're paying out of your bank account or what that rate is that's like that one line item on your bill. Um, by using less energy through energy efficiency or by installing solar or wind or investing in these sorts of clean energy um, uh, in, uh, resources, alongside of storage, you can make your overall bill go down because you're being more efficient about the way you're using electricity, right? So yeah. I, think, I think there's a small distinction that I'd like to just call out there. And then yeah. I think also um, it's, the lights are on here because of the very, very hard work of the Public Service Commission. I'm a, I'm a former Maryland commissioner, for those of you who don't know me, and um, I can tell you it is what keeps you up at night. Um, it is uh, the allowance of companies like Exelon to make these investments to help you keep your lights on that are allowing us to be able to even afford more clean energy. So it's a little bit of a virtuous cycle in there. And so I just wanted to kind of blow that question up a little bit. No, I think that's a, a good point and, and centers on, on the energy, efficient aspect, energy efficiency aspect of it. So I think um, I would add to that, and you're, you're right, that the total bill is different than the, the rate per kilowatt hour. I think there's also another distinction is the type of energy service is changing from a uh, uh, central station power plant transmission distribution line to the house to or or business uh, is changing rather radically uh, uh, not in Maryland but for um, Marine Corps base at Paris Island we made an 80 million dollar investment that included uh, lighting heating cooling upgrades on-site cogeneration using natural gas uh, seven or eight megawatt PV farm and uh, seven megawatt hour um, uh, Tesla storage system. And uh, the Marine Corps base at, at Paris Island is worried about two things, um, resiliency from bad guys cutting the uh, power and gas lines, uh, particularly the power lines, uh, but also rising sea level 
conditions uh, at, at an island environment. And they, they felt that the only way to ensure continued operations on base was to have ability to island themselves. And mm -hmm. they can do that for about 80% of the time. Wow. Um, and that's just a different product than uh, what a uh, utility can provide. Yeah. Products are changing quite a bit. I mean, if you look at even the way storage is used, it can be used as generation, as a sort right. of source of energy. It can be used as transmission upgrade or transmission. Uh, it can be used at the distribution level, or it can be used in those sort of the wholesale um, uh, ancillary services where it's helping regulation, it's helping um, power quality. And, and so right. that is one specific uh, investment that is used across all the silos of what is our energy market. And that is actually something very different because you're now using a single investment for multiple uses. And that's getting more efficient with it. And that's sort of what's changing our markets. It's so exciting right now. You know, sure. it, 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 as exciting as uh, new technology is, uh, and we love energy storage. MEA is one of the uh, is the administrator of the tax right. credit. We actually we have our first applications in. We have five applications in already, um, and we make major investments uh, into our grantees. But we've also been working a lot on rate design. And when we talk about energy efficiency, it's about pattern behavior as well. And if we can use rate design, and so what do I mean by that? If we can use rate design to change behavior we can actually achieve efficiency as well. And so what do I mean by that? It's not just using less, but maybe using at different times of the day. By delaying use within households to after midnight when rates are lower and, de uh, and decreasing demand at peak times. What we can do, and, and, and we're starting to see this in Maryland. Maryland P Public Service Commission has initiated the Grid of the Future Proceeding, PC44. And among the work groups uh, was actually that of the rate design work group. And I know this sounds pretty like mundane and boring, but if we can, but as, as, as we all know, when we try to explain our families at Thanksgiving, what <laughs> this, we do. This is a policy panel. It's okay to get a little mundane. <laughs> it's a, it can be a little confusing as we're asking <laughs> to pass the gravy. So, uh, so what do I mean by the, by this? If we can take uh, rate design and we can reward off-peak behavior and in, in, in essence, over that of peak behavior, we can actually bend curves mm -hmm. in a way that is not just good for individual um, adopters of technology or investors of technology, but for the distribution uh, service area as a whole. But it's not just our regulated utilities. You know, before the Public Service Commission right now is a proceeding uh, that allow, that in which uh, Maryland's retail suppliers have petitioned to actually have the ability to bill customers directly. So if a, a Maryland retail, uh, a residential uh, customer actually would like to, they could get a Constellation bill rather than a BGE bill. Right. Or they could get a direct energy bill as opposed to a BGE bill, uh, or a Pepco bill, or a Delmarva bill. And so by doing that and allowing retail energy suppliers to be able to directly connect with their customers, they can actually do a lot of the education and speak to the merits of time of use rates yeah. and actually build more exotic programs that may actually suit customers in a way that may be different with it from what they're used to, but that they can ultimately, A, achieve energy savings for their household, but also enjoy uh, and provide energy savings for the entire grid. Sure. So there's a we, number of different ways to get touch this. Yeah. J yeah. Dive in. Okay. Dive in. So uh, very we'll, we'll close the doors if people start the, leaving. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's snowing. They won't. And <laughs> no one wants has, to leave anyhow. Uh, has pioneered the concept of, of carbon count, which is now uh, owned mm -hmm. by the Alliance to Save Energy. And the concept is if uh, carbon counts and capital is scarce, we ought to make the most impactful investments. And we use this as a secondary investment metric. We always look at the investment attributes first. But it is very confusing in the energy business to keep the, the ultimate goal in if you want to do sustainable investing of where's the carbon, where's the greenhouse gas emissions. So carbon count allows us to uh, calculate uh, an investment's metric tons of greenhouse gas equivalent in the first year told you I was going to be wonkish, divided by the amount of capital, it comes up with a ratio. Um, so we see wind projects in the Midwest as being extremely impactful, yeah. efficiency projects in the Northeast being very impactful, 
That same efficiency project or solar project in California, not very impactful on carbon. There's not much carbon in California. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would argue rate design initiatives also have to look at that because I think utility commissions have a tendency and utilities have a tendency to look at system efficiency versus the carbon intensity. Mm -hmm. And they're not the same thing. You can lower rates and increase carbon, and that may be a, the public policy choice. Yeah. But let's 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 be critical in in our thinking on on the rate design initiative. Well, what we're I think getting. Thanks. it depends on the states. I mean, and and perhaps a former commissioner could weigh in on this, but it really depends on what the state's commission's mandate is too, right? Uh, I mean, not all states have a, a mandate for a commission to consider carbon as a as a matter before sure. before the state. It's their mandate That's to fine. maintain Just infrastructure. Others yeah, should be is, me measuring it. I have to say, there is um, there is an element of time as well as geography as to where you're using mm -hmm. and what the impact of your energy use is and the and the generation itself. So uh, it depends on what your policy goal is, and as you say, if a state doesn't have a policy goal of environmental impact, then so be it, then that it doesn't matter. But if you do, if you care about the environmental impact of your energy generation, distribution, and use, then in that case, geography is just as important as the time. Yeah. And so I think they're both a part of that. Well, and I think that that's one of the, the key takeaways that we should take from this panel in this, in this conversation. It, could, it gets a little bit complicated, but I think that in terms of shifting to cleaner energy generation, energy efficiency, and, and use, uh, that's an important thing. The the old economist in me, you know, just understands, you know, price and quantity is, is how things are are set. Uh, but but time matters, quality matters in terms of, of where consumer is demand is for the the quality of the ener of of in terms of carbon of the energy that is being consumed. Uh, so so I appreciate all of your your comments to help help get to that. Um, one thing that, that we do read about in, in the popular press, and it comes up in debates and it gets political, uh, but, but the, Maryland has a, a policy for a renewable portfolio standard. How, can that, how does the renewable portfolio standard help or complicate the matter of driving investment into clean energy? You want to take that, John? <laughs> We also, we also only have 10 minutes, okay. so. <laughs> so uh, Maryland does have an RPS, and it was adopted close to 15 years ago, and we have a current goal of 25% uh, by 2020. But what is lost oftentimes in the debate about the state's renewable portfolio standard is that it really is a compliance mechanism. Retail suppliers selling in Maryland's marketplace need to match a certain percentage of their sales with renewable energy credits. And so theoretically, you could have a retail supplier that is uh, procuring their electricity from um, carbonized sources um, and comply with the state's RPS just by the procurement of these recs. Now, the state actually spent in 2016, the last year for which we have numbers, about $135 million in uh, compliance costs. Retail suppliers in Maryland spent $135 million to comply with the state's RPS. What's interesting, though, is that while the state's RPS is carved up into uh, certain uh, tiers, that tier one non-solar made up the largest, and 86.7% of RECs that were, that were procured and retired in 2016 actually came from out-of-state sources. So when advocates discuss about the impact mm -hmm. on in-state development, we do see that. We do see that in solar, when, when the mandate is, is that solar job, uh, is that solar qualifying solar under Maryland's RPS need to be connected to the state's and state distribution system. However, when we look at those states who have retired RECs, from, what, from those states from where uh, retired RECs come, one of the states is North Dakota. We've retired uh, the equivalent of $4 million worth of RECs yeah. in North Dakota in 2016. So right now we're in the process of a study. It was passed last year by the General Assembly, signed into law by the governor. It's a, it's a two and a half year study that will look at the RPS uh, and determine really in a look back uh, whether the RPS is, being, is doing what it had intended to do. I think sure. we have a lot of successes to show for the RPS and then I think there's still a lot of questions that are still left out there with RPS policy. Great, thanks for that clarification. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the RPS study uh, because I think uh, that tool can look at this issue very holistically about broadly, I think more than just the RPS, the entirety of clean energy policies that the state uh, might want to, 
take a review of and decide whether they need to be uh, updated um, as they have been on the books for a while. Um, you know, uh, the prior qu question talked a little bit about cost and impact to, to customers, and I think that is an important uh, consideration. Um, I think, uh, you know, the public support for clean energy policies is huge. You see, everyone sees all the studies. Um, I think that is, is undeniable. Um, you want to keep costs as low as possible, then I think you need a balanced approach. One of those things is, a, you know, when we, if we want to focus then on the, the issue of emissions and carbon, 88% of the emission-free generation in this state comes from Calvert Cliffs. Obviously, two huge nuclear reactors, um, but when you talk about the amount of carbon-free electricity that those plants produce, that's tremendous. Yeah. And the loss of those plants, of course, would put the state in a huge hole as it comes to carbon emissions. Now, those plants are licensed to operate until 2034 and 2036, respectively, so they still have a, a long lifespan left. Uh, but they are part of why we in Maryland have done a good job with emissions and the loss of any of that generation would put the state in a huge, huge hole that would, the, the difficulty in getting back to those levels would be astronomical from a cost standpoint from wind and solar and the other clean resources we have. So that needs to be part of the discussion when we're thinking about revising policies and to not lose sight of that huge asset. Okay, that's very helpful to think does about. Excellent, just, a, just a question. Um, does Exxon have a view on uh, national carbon tax? I mean, I would think it would be extremely supportive. Yeah, we've long, you know, we were, we were out there in support yeah. of Waxman-Markey when yeah, that was okay. being debated, and, uh, you know, it seems like a long time any, ago. Any Exxon, prospects? Uh, I don't see any <laughs> prospects uh, currently, but we do have elections coming up in November, and, you know, elections who knows where the sea change uh, happens. Understood. Well, and that's back to where we started from uh, with, the, with the Washington update. Um, I do want to take a second just to, to thank all of our, our panelists here. Thanks for braving the weather. Uh, and we will take a 10-minute break here to transition to the next panel. Uh, but thank you all for, for participating in the discussion this morning.